So um, I'm going to be reading a part from my novel um, about um, a very well-meaning but very clueless dad. The idea came to Carly's father amid the whir of a hundred handheld sanders at Bunny Gardner's Sweet Sixteen, an event that had burst into life with the birthday girl's parents whipping a satin drape off their pedestal daughter at the center of the Glen Club Ballroom, where she held a pose she would later tell her classmates was winged victory, except not headless. Through applause, people would say she milked a bit too long before stepping down. Hours later, not long after the genesis of Francis Wells' idea, the party would meet a premature death with a cloud of plaster dust covering the gardener's guests, as well as the, as the dessert table graced with sugar-spun Giacometti's and the life-size ice sculpture of Michelangelo's David, whose penis had all evening been dripping syphilitically. The thinker's meltdown was considerably less dramatic, his forehead slowly receding while his chin trickled down his arm. Unlike the David, he'd been placed far from the marble fireplaces, like Francis Wells, he looked bored. By 10 p.m. there had been three slideshows, one of which, Hop Art, a portfolio, projected photos of Bunny's own work onto the ballroom ba walls, interspersed with a series of dinner courses as carefully presented and unsatisfying as Francis's wife. Four heirloom beet slices, one golden, two albino, one striped, next to a Cyrillic drizzle of dressing above a pinch of bitter greens had constituted the composed salad. The tower of veal medallions and foie gras had taken longer to deconstruct than to eat. And the flavor of Bunny's silver iced cake in the shape of Kuhn's rabbit sculpture remained a mystery, guests having been enjoined from approaching the dessert table until the presentation of the party favors, heads, their own, cast in plaster, which were at this moment, to use Sissy Gardner's phrase, being finished tableside. Across the table, one of the gardener's hireling artists used a sander to reduce the pudginess of Francis's daughter's plaster chin and eliminate acne bumps from her plaster cheeks, while Carly looked on silently with an embarrassed half-smile. A month earlier, after she and her friends had been summoned to the gardener's home for their castings, she'd returned in a rare, expansive mood, smears of alginate on her cheeks and flecks of plaster in her hair. At the dinner table, she'd laughed about the solarium having been turned into a triage ward with kids lying face up on portable massage tables while plaster was applied to their faces, about Bunny requiring the presence of her hypnotist to talk her through the same claustrophobic process to which she was subjecting 100 of her friends, about how Hunter Kay's agreeing to hold Bunny's hand through the ordeal had inspired in so many of the other girls a similar swoon-worthy malady. Francis had relished the stories for the way his daughter captured people without trapping them, laughing about how they acted without laughing at them. Though he knew most of those girls didn't invite his daughter to things, didn't include her, as his wife put it. There was still a lilt of affection in Carly's voice for them, as if to say, it's funny, but I get it. It's funny, but we're all funny. It's funny, but I'm no better. The richness of her stories, the detail in which she told them, had nearly compensated for the usual bland fatlessness of the dinner his wife had designed and had had the cook execute everything poached or steamed or raw. He'd stood and gone over to Carly's chair to pat her on the back and say, my funny, tough girl, the tender ones get picked, Gretchen had said, studying, as studying an asparagus tip poised on her fork. Carly had shrugged like a turtle, desperate not to be seen, retreating into the humid silence she'd begun admitting at puberty. All it took to shut her down, shut her up, was a barb from his wife or a slight from those same classmates she knew were phony and insipid. For the first time, Francis had formed in his head the words for what was worrying him. Carly was disappearing, letting insubstantial people chip off pe pieces of herself. As the air thickened now at Bunny's party with the dust of everyone's children's effaced pimples and straightened noses and sharpened cheekbones, Francis was overcome by a lightheadedness another man might have attributed to the poor ventilation or his third after-dinner scotch. Francis, however, recognized it as the exact sensation he'd experienced the night he'd brainstormed the marble bra, the invention that had made his fortune. It was the promise of creation, the dawning of change. He examined his newborn idea from every angle, counting its fingers and toes and falling in love, a birthday present for his daughter. 
a gift for a girl who sat still at the table while she watched her own erasure. In a Coon's balloon reflection, Hunter Kay saw Carly's father standing behind him, convexed. Francis opened his jacket to reveal cigars in the inside breast pocket. Hunter nodded. Like his daughter, Francis had a knack for offering people what they needed without their asking. He followed Francis to the club's deck. I suppose Carly told you about Gretchen's meeting with that teacher, Francis said, cutting a cigar. Its head disappeared over the railing into the darkness below. Bradford Nagel, who taught junior year English, was an institution at Montclair Academy, one most people agreed needed institutionalization. Despite, however, his manifest insanity, getting a college recommendation letter from him was crucial. In 30 years, I've never encountered a student less intellectually engaged, Nagel had told Gretchen the week before. She has the passion of a puddle, the bastard said. Francis took a deep breath. Hunter coughed, though not from the smoke. Carly has passion, Francis, not just intellectually, but the gardener girl has herself an interest, Francis said. That's what you're supposed to have these days, Gretchen says. Carly needs a passion. I'm going to get her one. It was the kind of statement that occasioned Francis being laughed at behind his back, a nouveau directness that for years had kept him and Gretchen out of the club until Hunter's mother had sponsored them in. That Francis had earned his money instead of inheriting it, that he'd made his millions focusing on his own passion, breasts, was one of the many things Hunter admired about him. That vanity had no grip on him was another. At 6'4", he had the build of an ex-athlete who let his muscles go to fat because they no longer served him a use. No matter how well-tailored were his Armani suits, he always looked a little wrong in them, like a bear in a tuxedo, a dancing bear you thought was tame, until you turned your back and it decided it was hungry. Glancing behind him toward the floor-to-ceiling windows, Hunter caught a glimpse of Carly and their friend Amber dancing with their plaster heads held out in front of them, trunkless partners. At the tables, guests rubbed their eyes and fanned the dust from the air. Overwhelming, Bunny's passion, Hunter said. Seems she wants us to breathe it. Bunny's actual interest was, in fact, musical theater, though she wasn't a particularly good singer or dancer or actress. She performed in plays for the love of it, or had until last year when her private college counselor had insisted to her parents that she needed rebranding if she need, wanted any shot at the, the real Ivies or the hidden Ivies or even given Bunny's inability to break the 95th percentile on her PSATs, the public Ivies. If she couldn't be good at something, she ought at least take up a unique activity. Curling, the counselor had suggested, archery having already been adopted several months earlier by another Montclair Academy student whose parents had taken their progeny's mediocrity a little more seriously. Luckily for Bunny, who'd been dreading spending the summer in remedial curling camp in Canada, her art teacher had mentioned Bunny's mixed-media sculpture project to the gardeners. And though she hadn't exactly said that Bunny had talent, she had called Bunny's choice to create a mobile out of old computer parts and raw vegetables unusual. <laughs> One of a kind, Francis said now, as he described to Hunter his idea for a birthday gift to ignite in Carly an intellectual passion. Not a car, not a trip. I want to buy Carly something to love. It's an interesting concept, Hunter ventured, unusual. But Francis, will she love this love? Thank you.